Welcome to the Bounty Zero X podcast. I'm your host, Angelo Adam, founder and CEO of Bounty Zero X. Bounty Zero X is a decentralized bounty hunting network powered by the BNTY token. My guest on the show is Marcus Lim, CEO and co founder of Zipmex Exchange. Zipmex is a fully licensed Singapore-based digital asset exchange that aims to provide advanced services for digital currency traders and liquidity providers. Uh, Marcus, as CEO, uh, was previously founder and CEO of OneFlare, Australia's fastest-growing marketplace for local services, which was acquired by Fairfax Media. And he was also the winner of the Ant Hill Entrepreneur Award and Deloitte APAC Fast 500. Uh, Marcus, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Angela. So can you tell me and my listeners a little bit about Zipmex? Yeah, so as you kind of mentioned, you know, uh, Zipmex is you know, a fully licensed uh, digital asset exchange. You know, we're based out in Singapore. Uh, our focus is in, in Southeast Asia. So we have currently offices in uh, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, and also in Australia. Um, what you know our focus really is is in this region only and um you know and and at this stage we are focused on you know providing the fiat on ramps for uh for our exchange so you know uh, we currently provide usd um you know but we're going to provide thai bar indonesian rupiah australian dollars uh, and also singapore dollars in in the second quarter of this year um so that's kind of our our, our first stage um uh, and in terms of, um, you know, what we've done so far, we've, we've done a, a partnership agreement, a joint venture with a listed company uh, in, in Thailand, uh, which is AEC Securities. It's a publicly listed company that deals in securities and brokerage and also investment banking. Um, we've also brought on board the, the former chairman of the stock exchange of Thailand, uh, Dr. Satit. Uh, so together, you know, we have jointly applied for the um, the, the digital asset exchange license in in, in Thailand, uh, and there are only three uh, exchanges that are licensed at the moment, and and we're looking to be the fourth. Um, so you know what we're looking to do is you know to be regulated first, um, and and that's very important because our vision is to be the most trusted. Um, where in in this industry uh, there has been a lot of questions on uh, trusted exchanges, or, or rather the trust. And security of exchanges, um, and so our, our messaging and, and our positioning is, you know, of, of wanting to be trusted like a bank. Um, so, so that's where, uh, you know, that's what we're looking to do. Oh, that sounds great. So, you mentioned a lot of uh, interesting things that I'd like to dig into in further detail uh, during a podcast. So, sure. you guys are planning on becoming the. Uh, leading exchange in Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines. And they currently, you would say there's three other Thai licensed exchanges that you compete with. So what right. are what are the challenges in be, for Zipmex to become uh, the largest, most trusted digital ex, uh, exchange in Southeast Asia? I, I think in terms of to, in, in being trusted, uh, there there are a number of main factors here. I think one is to be regulated, and I think in this industry, um, regulation is still very weak. Um, you know, there are some jurisdictions like Thailand that have um, you know sped up that process, and hence they have a license program. Um, other jurisdictions like Indonesia or Vietnam uh, don't have a, a license program at all. Um, so I think first thing, you know, is being regulated in, in jurisdictions where they have regulations. Uh, second is, is you, know, you know, getting the right partnerships and, and the right uh, uh, advisors and investors on board. So we've done that with AEC and we've done that with, you know, Dr. Satit as the former chairman. Um, so, you know, adding, adding the right people on board adds credibility to the business. Um, and that really helps to, to you know, create that, that level of trust and confidence with, with consumers. Um, and thirdly is, you know, having the right technology as well. Um, so we work with a technology partner in the US uh, to provide us with the exchange platform um, and to ensure that, you know, client uh, assets are, are safe with us. Uh, and just, you know, to add that lay on top is, you know, we're about to offer, you know, a fully insured custody solution 
um, where users uh, assets that are, are held with us on our exchange will be fully insured by um, a fairly large insurer, which I can't mention at this point in time. Um, but uh, that that's you know currently what we're planning to 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 implement. So those are kind of the three main factors um, that we're trying to do, uh, that we're working on to to build trust. Um, now in terms of uh, the, our, our kind of competitive edge, uh, you know, compared to the other exchanges in in this region, is a lot of uh, a lot of these exchanges in whether it's Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, or Vietnam, they're very much focused in a local market. Um, and, and don't actually give you users that exposure to the global market or the regional markets. Uh, where we're very different is that we're actually regional from day one. Um, so our exchange is scaled in a way that allows us to build these fiat on ramps in each of these jurisdictions. So Thailand, so we are we already have the platform provision for Thailand, you know, to re receive Thai baht, Indonesia to receive receive Indonesian rupiah you know, Singapore and also Australia, and then we'll start to build out the Philippines, Vietnam, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and then what's so good about that is obviously we can share the liquidity from, you know, from all, all parts of the region. Um, the main problem with a lot of exchanges in those specific jurisdictions is the lack of liquidity. Um, and as you know, you know, if you kind of dig into to some of these exchanges, uh, that is the reason why they only kind of provide kind of five tokens or maybe up to 10 tokens. Uh, anything further, and, and and they're usually kind of the main ones, you know, Bitcoin, Eth, EOS, uh, Ripple, so on and so forth, because that those are the tokens that have the you know the, the biggest market cap and the most amount of liquidity. The problem is, you know, being able to list the other tokens, um, and and because and and the reason why they can't do that is because they they don't have that liquidity. Um, where we can kind of come into play is, you know, because we're regional from day one, we can draw liquidity from multiple locations. Pull them into the same platform and allow users to be able to to be able to trade on that liquidity. So that I think that's very important. Yeah. So that's there's a lot of uh, things that I want to jump into. Um, so, but I want to focus on the uh, at first. I want to focus on the licensing. Um, yeah. So you hear that term, uh, you know, mentioned a lot these days, especially in the context of exchanges, and how important it is for them to be fully licensed, accredited, and compliant with the regulations. Uh, so what exactly does that mean from a practical perspective? Like, let's say uh, you're starting an exchange, and do you, does that mean that you need to go to the regulatory authorities in each country that you're operating in and seek approval and licensing from them? And what does that process look like? So what uh, checks do you need to go through? and uh, what type of process does the uh, licensing for a cryptocurrency exchange consist of? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So in, in some jurisdictions where there are no specific licenses, like for example, in Indonesia, there is no specific license a, a crypto exchange needs to apply for. What we typically do is we would build a relationship with the regulators. Uh, we would inform them of our presence in the country. Um, you know, we will, you know, submit documentations regarding, you know, our AML and, and, and KYC process. Um, so, so that's um, the biggest concern for a lot of the regulators, I think, globally is, is AML and KYC. Um, and, and I can speak specifically for Thailand as we've gone through this process, you know, is they, they want to ensure that we have the right process and controls in place. Um, in, in signing up customers, uh, in receiving, you know, uh, the, the local currency, the fiat currency, um, and how are we kind of tracking and monitoring, you know, the activity on the exchange itself, uh, and also, you know, the, uh, the robustness of the platform and, um, you know, how we're able to kind of handle uh, trading activities and, and also, you know, whether what would happen, you know, if uh, say the platform, go, you know, uh, goes down, for whatever reason, you know, what would be our, our support capabilities? So, um, and then on top of that, they want to know, you know, who's who's part of the team. So we need, you know, so these are kind of the major components, and, and within each of these components, there are very specific questions on, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, for example, you know, say for, for anti-money laundering, uh, they want to. To, to ensure that we have a, an AML policy. And that AML policy is about like, you know, 20 pages. So we'll go into, you know, 
all the risk mitigations, all the um, you know types of information we'll be collecting, um, you know, um, and and the reporting that we'll be doing. Um, and they're very kind of specific for each country. So Australia would have a different set of AML policy compared to to Thailand, uh, because you know different you know regulators want different things. Uh, but ultimately, I think the principles are, are fairly similar. The framework's fairly similar, um, but each country have their nuances. Yeah, that's so important. I mean, especially since this uh, cryptocurrency exchange industry is so fraught with uh, being susceptible and targets for hackers and so every week you're hearing about new exchanges that are being hacked and uh, hit BTC just this week is the most recent but there's always a new exchange in the news that's uh, you know unfortunately being the target of hackers and so I can understand why from the perspective of the regulators having good security protocols in place and uh, managing user privacy when dealing with funds is so important so yeah. Now, for your KYC AML, I mean, because we have a AML KYC on our platform also for yeah. the bounty hunters when they complete tasks, and yeah. so we have worked with uh, on Fido and Civic, uh, and uh, to to basically perform the KYC check. So they have like an integration with our platform. So yeah. on your guys' exchange, do you guys do all the AML KYC yourselves, or do you guys outsource it to a third party? Yeah, so we, we outsource it as well. So for KYC, we use um, Identity Mind, and um, Identity Mind, I think, is you know pretty well established in the US. Um, and you know they've got a very large set of databases that they run these checks on. Um, so that's integrated on our platform. Uh, I know a number of exchanges. You know, for example, Binance use Identity Mind now. At least they've announced to use Identity Mind. Um, you know, so but I, I, you know. These KYC, you know, companies uh, ultimately will probably get you 60, 70 percent of the way there, um, because simply because you know their their databases might be skewed to a certain um, parts of the world. Um, so for for us, we still need to, um, you know, uh, I guess hook in or, or integrate with um, other types of databases locally uh, to get more relevant information about our users that are signing up. You know, so for example, in Thailand, um, you know, the, the the users that are that are in Thailand may not be, you know, uh, uh, may, may not be in in uh, the databases that that identity identity mine uses. Uh, some might be, so there might be some overlaps, but I would say kind of a lot of them aren't. Um, so we will need to kind of you know work with you know the local regulators. Uh, to do these checks, um, uh, you know. Likewise, I think you know for for Australia, for Indonesia as well. Um, you know, some of these databases uh, don't fully cover these yet these uh, areas. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, I can uh, relate to that. Also, um, you know, we've had that similar experience with uh, users signing up, doing the KYC checks. And you know the the databases are inherently limited in terms of the amount of information they have on government issued IDs and and what they do with that information. So if a user provides their you know identity, their let's say their their documentation, their government issued ID or um, you know some form of uh, address verification or utility bills, um, you know there's only so much check that the KYC company can do to verify if that data is even is accurate or correct because there's nothing to match it up against in yep. many cases, especially in a lot of countries like uh, in Africa and uh, you know in places where the where the the system is less uh, I guess robust and there's less uh, you know digitization of some of these documents. So yeah, okay. I mean that it's an imperfect system and a lot of times they come back. You know, so it's just you guys. I think uh, trying to make the best effort. So there's like different levels of KYC you can do. Also, with just a simple, you know, check, uh, receive the 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 ID, and then or then just back check it with reference databases and you know different pieces of ID. So there are lots of different levels, and um, I think depending on you know, what the security requirements are. You can do level one, level two, or, or level three. And I notice you guys have like three different levels and each one entitles users to perform increasingly large transactions. 
Um, yep. And with the the highest one being, I think like fifteen thousand, and like the fiat on ramp. So can you do fiat deposits and withdrawals with only the with the first level one and two, or do you need to have level three on your guys' exchanges to do fiat? No, we, we really need a level three to, to do that um, simply because we're taking a local currency there. Um, so, you know, we would need to know uh, who that person is or who that entity is uh, that will be depositing and withdrawing. Uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. All right. So let's move on to some of the features which make your exchange unique compared to some of the other uh, competitor exchanges. Yeah. Um, so you guys have a set of features which is you know uh, setting you apart, I guess, from the other exchanges. So you're planning on offering security tokens in the future, which is something that is a little bit more complex and requires a lot more regulations and uh, and uh, compared to just offering regular utility tokens, let's say, or the regular Bitcoin. Um, so the security token. Uh, licensing requirements and then you're planning to do the margin trading yep. uh, which is also another challenge and then the mobile apps uh, so maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, each of those or take we can take them one at a time and uh, uh, go into a little bit about how you guys are planning on um, implementing those uh, features yeah so so for margin trading I think um, you know, other exchanges already provide this, like BitMEX and Wafi and so on and so forth. Um, you know, we're going to provide it in, in June this year, hopefully. Um, and, you know, I think the, the way it would work would be fairly similar. Um, however, you know, we're really kind of exploring to see how we could allow, you know, um, so, so typically for, for, for margin trading, people will kind of deposit, say, for, you know, Bitcoin and, and use that as kind of their equity. Um, and, and, and then the exchange will provide the margin to them to be able to kind of trade. What we're looking to do is, you know, allow users to deposit their fiat um, and not having to kind of convert into Bitcoin, but just leave it in a fiat. And then we use the fiat as the collateral um, in, in order to, to allow them to kind of uh, uh, trade on a, on a margin. So, so that's, that's one, uh, you know, one thing that we're, we're looking to implement. And I think that'll be a, a, a huge differentiator uh, from a product basis and also from the, the offering basis uh, in each of these jurisdictions, which allow us to do margin trading. So, for example, in Australia, there's there's really kind of no, you know, restriction. So we will allow you know users to kind of deposit their AUD, um, and then we'll provide them with margin on that. Um, I think margin trading is 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 fairly interesting. I mean, it's an evolution of of you know, uh, I, I guess it's the next stage you know for us to kind of provide to our users who who want to get more exposure. Um, obviously on the upside uh, uh, you know on, on a range of different types of uh, uh, I guess so-called investment products or, or, or types of investments um, the second one is um, you know uh, it goes back to the, the security and, and, and the trust the platform is providing insurance on the on the custody of assets um, so we're working with a you know a very reputable uh, insurer so if I say their name you definitely know um, they will be providing uh, insurance on you know the custody of assets and how that works is that we we actually work with a vault um, like a, an actual vault that stores gold bullions um, and so that insurer actually ins uh, insures the vault so you know our cold storage assets will be in that vault um, and so uh, we that's how we were able to kind of get this coverage um, so I think that that's very important. None of these exchanges in the region actually provide this, um, and we we work together with a, a third party to to make this happen. Um, so and then the the third one is um, you know STOs. So uh, I think look safely saying you know most exchanges don't provide STO listings at this point in time. Um, we are very excited to to be able to do it. Um, we have the license from the Philippines. Um, which allows us to deal in all types of virtual currencies. Uh, so this is the FTS or VCE license, uh, which is issued by CESA in Philippines. Um, but, you know, as you mentioned, STO is a bit more complex and, each, um, and because the nature of, of the token itself requires 
you know, the, the actual token or the issuers of the tokens to be regulated um, by each of the jurisdictions where, we, you know, those issuers need to, to raise capital from, whether it's Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan. Um, for us as an exchange, we need to comply as well. And so we're going through that process. Um, and, uh, and hopefully, you know, I think this is obviously going to take a bit longer than expected, unlike ICOs where I think the rush came in a lot faster. <laughs> Uh, and, and I don't think STO will definitely do that as well. Uh, it, sorry, in terms of you know all these STO companies listing, I don't think it'll be as fast as what we saw with ICOs. Um, but we definitely want to uh, provide that, that capability on our platform, which the re, you know which which these exchanges in the, in the region don't provide at this point in time. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to come out with our own exchange token. Um, I can't really you know provide too much information on that, but it will be very unique. Uh, compared to what's already out there. Um, and I understand that a lot of the local exchanges don't provide their own exchange tokens. Uh, so that's something that we are, are, are working on as well. Um, and I think the, the other things, uh, you know, providing, you know, OTC capabilities, you know, liquidity, I think those aren't very, uh, I would say, kind of uh, pure, unique selling points. Uh, but they are definitely things that we offer that some exchanges do and some exchanges don't. Um, but, you know, it's just, you know, providing these different pieces in the ecosystem itself. Mm -hmm. So have you guys decided or set or, uh, a number, uh, the amount of margin that you're going to uh, allow a maximum uh, up to? So if people want to trade on margin, like how much they'll be able to leverage their, uh, their balance? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we haven't, you know, we, we're still internally discussing on, on what that should be. Uh, we haven't set that number yet. I think it's going to be, um, it's something that we need to work out uh, to ensure the sustainability of this product. Um, um, so, you know, uh, yeah, to, to answer your question, we don't have a number yet. Okay. And so you guys currently, you recently added Litecoin, Ripple, EOS, so, and then you have Bitcoin, Ethereum. So will you be adding stable, any stable coin uh, trading pairs? Yeah. So, you know, we're going to offer USDT um, and, and other derivatives of, of, of uh, USDT. Um, um, we're looking at... Um, actually you know working on an australian uh, uh, stable coin um because of our partnership in australia so we we're, we're partnered with um with decentralized capital in australia and we're, we're working very closely with a local bank there uh to see if we can provide an aud stable coin okay cool um so what is the process that you have uh so for adding new currencies, so like Coinbase has, you know, recently announced that they're going to be adding, uh, you know, uh, new currencies or new tokens. Um, so what is your process? Uh, do you work closely with the projects and do you have a, a type of uh, the things that you look for when you're deciding on uh, whether or not you're going to add a new trading pair to the exchange? Oh, yeah. So. So in terms of the tokens that we would be listing in the future, um, this will be dependent, yeah, on, on the partnerships that we broker uh, with these projects. Uh, so, um, you know, they, they would obviously have to go, go through, uh, you know, our internal process. So we have a listing, you know, listing requirement, listing rules. Um, and, you know, there's a request for information from these projects. Um, and then typically, you know, they will provide the information and, you know, once we're happy with that, you know, um, we will list them. Um, and then from there, we would kind of jointly build out the community on both ends to, to get users to come on board with us uh, and also provide incentives for their users to come on board. Um, that's for kind of existing projects. For new projects, you know, we'll still kind of go through the, the, the same process, but it will be dependent on them being able to um, you know, to raise the, the right amount of capital uh, for them to, to be listed. Uh, so, so that's kind of the, the typical process. Um, what we want to do is, you know, because we're, we're focused in Southeast Asia, uh, we want to list the type of projects that appeal to this particular market. Uh, so, for example, like in Australia, uh, where, you know, we were going to list, you know, Australian type projects. 
Uh, whereas, you know, in, in, in Thailand or in Singapore, you know, we'll list these projects that um, have appealed to, to this region. So you mentioned earlier the custodial solution. So I just want to draw out uh, why that's important and what exactly that means. So uh, we had on a previous episode of the podcast, uh, the CTO of BitGo, uh, Benedict Chan. He uh, is an advisor to our project. And uh, he talked a little bit about their their custodial solution and what it consists of and uh, basically what that well, for people who are listening what that means is they handle the uh, storage of I guess the cold storage of the exchanges uh, assets so yeah. that it increases the security uh, for uh, prevention of losses and hacks and, and that sort of thing. So yep. if, if a centralized exchange, uh, you know, one of the things about centralized exchanges, what we've seen over and over is that they're susceptible to hacks. Yep. Uh, people say, you know, the benefits of decentralized exchanges is that, you know, they're, the users hold the private keys, so they're less susceptible to that. So one of the important things for centralized exchanges to have, you know, good security uh, policies in place and having uh, a third-party custody service is one way to do that. So uh, if uh, exchange is holding funds for all their users and that consists of hundreds of millions of dollars in cold storage, um, that would be held by this third-party custodial service so that the exchange doesn't have to deal with all of the overhead and expenses and expertise required with uh, being a custodian of all these funds, and that also makes it more secure. So, um, is that a good? Uh, would you have anything else to add to that? Or is that a good summary of what this custodial solution is and why it's important for exchanges? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I think that pretty much sums it up. The, you know, the the importance here is. Um, the controls that these custodial services provide, and, and I guess you know what we're looking to to also provide as well. I mean, for our for us, it's kind of a broader vision where we want to you know jointly build it out um, because I think um, you know that there are other um, there are other things that we want to be to be doing in the future as well. For example, working with banks because ultimately the custodial service should be you know, should be what the bank is doing, and and they are doing that at the, at the moment for fiat currencies, right? So they store people's, you know, deposits, um, and uh, it's a natural it's a natural thing for a bank to do. Um, however, the banks don't have the capabilities at the moment to build out you know custodial service with digital assets. Um, very few, if not no, banks do that at the moment. Um, so what we want to do is we want to build out this this capability and and the good thing about custodial services is that uh, on on two on on both fronts you know whether it's on the the on on the custodial side and all all uh, on the client side is you know it requires uh, um, you know multiple parties to kind of sign off on the transaction uh, so you know for the custodial side it's multi signature so they would have kind of you know, multiple locations and multiple parties having to sign off on that one transaction. So, you know, if one person is compromised, you know, you still have multiple other parties to kind of verify, you know, whether that person is a bad actor within the organization uh, or whether that that transaction is valid or not. On the other side, on the, on the client side, is having multiple parties signing off on those transactions as well, which are also very important. So I guess in, in the case, for example, with Quadrigal, is that, you know, if the, uh, if the CEO or I guess company had you know uh, used a service like BitGo, um, then they shouldn't really have that problem. Um, you know, then it client, you know, uh, if the, if the CEO pass passes away or you know whatever happened to him, right? Um, uh, those those funds could still be you know um, uh, could still could you know could still be retrieved by other 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 people in the organization. Uh, and so I think that's the important factor. Uh, that's one. Uh, and then I think the security of it is is also very important. Um, where most of the hacks come into to the API and to the hot wallet. Uh, cold cold wallet is pretty hard to hack, obviously. Um, but what what typically happens is that there is a bad actor within the organization, and 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 when that happens, then you know that that's where the funds are, uh, are lost or stolen. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So you mentioned the the CEO of Quadriga Exchange and how I'm sure you know listeners are familiar with how he was uh, murdered. I think, and uh, he had the the keys and to the cold storage wallet with yep. you know m- millions of dollars and. That became kind of an infamous story, and there was a lot of conspiracy around it about how maybe people were speculating that you know the funds were never there to begin with, and at some point they began to uh, you know use some of the cold storage funds to pay out other depositors, and so the funds were never there to begin with. Um, and I think like uh, the CEO of Coinbase or Kraken issued some statements on, they had done some investigation into it and um, they would come to some conclusion. Uh, but that that's kind of a unique situation that has raised a lot of eyebrows because of the amount of money that was involved in it. And also because of the, you know, the, the unique situation around his death and, uh, you know, some people people are saying that he faked his death, and um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that, or if you have, or if you're familiar with that situation, and uh, what your understanding is of, about what happened with that. Um, look, I, I think um, you know my my thoughts around it is, you know, um, this is the main issue, right, with a lot of exchanges, is that. Um, you know, there, there, there are lack of controls, lack of regulation, uh, and, you know, at the moment, you know, users, uh, you know, provide this blind trust, unfortunately, uh, because there's really no better, better solution out there. Um, and, and this is what we, we want to do to kind of, you know, differentiate and establish ourselves. Um, because I think, you know, being, being regulated, you know, having the right controls and people on board, like a proper publicly listed company, um, users have that sense of trust that you know um, that a you know um, if, if you know like the the uh, I guess the executives or the advisors of the business won't be bad actors, um, and secondly, there are proper you know pro- corporate governance and controls in place, um, which which actually provides you know better stability and, and security for the for the the company itself. Um, I think a lot of these cases, you know, it, it's hard to say what has actually happened um, to the CEO of Quadrigal. Like, I mean, he could have faked his death. He could have actually been murdered. Um, I, I don't really know, right? But I guess the, the point is, you know, um, had they been properly, properly regulated and, and, and had the right people on board, um, then, you know, this sort of, you know, this sort of stuff won't happen. Um, and so it, it goes with other exchanges where, you know, uh, an exchange could say that you know they've been hacked, uh, or someone says that you know they've been hacked. But really, the the actual you know um, the the real answer behind it, or real reason behind it, we don't know. You know, uh, I mean, it's so easy for, for example, uh, you know, an exchange, um, you know, that that you say a top thirty, top twenty exchange, um, you know, and uh, you know they the 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 company could say, look, you know, we've been hacked. But the reality is that the founders could have just run off with the money. We don't know, right? Um, and there and there is huge incentives sometimes for these people within the organizations to be bad actors because of of the amount of money that is in there. Um, and and if they were to 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 you know um, to to steal that money, um, you know that yeah, there's uh and and how easy is it for them to kind of steal that money? It's you know there's huge incentive there. So I think I think that that's the reason why there's kind of lack of like controls at the moment, um, and and that's why we see a lot of you know these sorts of cases popping up. Yeah, I mean, hopefully with over time, with more professionalism coming into the marketplace, you know, this will become more less common, more more rare uh, over time because it seems like you know it's definitely uh, you know more professional uh, companies are coming to the space and. Uh, you know, with better be- better practices, uh, better policies and guidelines, uh, because you know, for a lot of the time, you know, the, the, the cryptocurrency space has been evolving over time. You know, it's beca- been becoming more professional, and uh, you know, but for a lot of the time, it was just basically amateurs who don't really have a lot of experience, uh, just kind of developing things on the fly without 
you know, best practices or good standards in place. So, um, you know, hopefully it's kind of in a way like uh, the way, you know, over time other industries have evolved and uh, matured and, you know, the cryptocurrency industry is still pretty young in, in relative terms. So the speed at which it's kind of evolving and maturing is is pretty impressive, but still all of the sums of money involved make it so that it's kind of needs to, to uh, evolve quickly. There's so much money is on at stake here. Yep. Um, so let's jump over to the um, another uh, topic that was has been in the news uh, lately related to the volume. So I think there was a study conducted by uh, the SEC or uh, one of the uh, companies that were uh, appealing to the SEC to issue uh, a Bitcoin ETF or, uh, the, or something related to like the CFTC issuing a report on the on the, the volume of Bitcoin transactions that are traded on a regular basis yeah. across all the different exchanges. And they did this really in-depth analysis where they looked at a lot of different uh, statistical features which uh, raised some flags about which exchanges were faking volume and which ones weren't. And they think they concluded that you know a vast majority of the daily trading volume for Bitcoin is, is not real, like a, a 80 or 90 percent. Um, and so even even taking that into account, it's, there's still quite a lot of volume being traded in Bitcoin but not nearly as much as uh, some of the exchanges would lead you lead one to believe just from, let's say, looking at coin market cap. And some of the analysis they did to come to that conclusion was pretty interesting. So they looked at um, some of the trading patterns, the lot sizes, uh, how the volume was traded. Uh, so it was pretty interesting. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this uh, this issue of exchanges faking volume in order to try to get more users and and how that all plays out. Yeah, I think um, uh, yeah, the, the the I think I the the most obvious reason for exchanges to to fake volume is so that they can kind of climb up the ladder board on coin market cap, and, and obviously CMC is you know the most you know highly viewed uh site uh for for this industry so you know being at the top of the ladder board you know we'll get a lot of views and, and in turn we'll get a lot of users to come on board um i think um it, you know it's something again like you mentioned before uh it just th this industry just needs to mature and evolve and, and you know faking volumes is uh is a means to an end really for a lot of the exchanges um I don't think they do it in like I mean that that's kind of mainly the the, rain, the main reasons. I mean the other reasons obviously market making making for certain tokens, um, you know. But faking the the actual volume itself is really to to kind of increase their the awareness within within the market. Um, so I think in the future what would happen is that um, someone will find out a way, or I guess the a regulator will find a way for us to, for, for them to kind of report uh the volumes correctly um and um you know and, and then you know most people will have a better picture on on who's performing and who's not yeah yeah that's a good point because in a way it can it can backfire for the exchanges that are faking volume because they think that oh if we fake our volume it'll make us look better on coin market cap and we'll get more business but then if it becomes known that they fake a lot of the volume then uh it could actually have a negative PR consequence because it looks like uh, to the community that you know it's not a positive thing to to be faking volume and to be known as a, a less reliable uh, exchange. Yep. Um, and um, and then I think one of the defenses that some of the exchanges argued was that you know we're not necessarily faking the exchange but we just have these policies in place which reward users who trade a lot of volume so mm -hmm. uh, this may not consist of all of the fake volume reports but for some of them uh, I think the exchanges were arguing oh we're not faking volume it's just that our users are 
trading a lot. And the reason why they're trading a lot is because they get better rates or we have incentives, uh, you know, with trading competitions and other types of things, uh, yep. which may make it appear that it's fake volume, but it's just users trying to get reduced fees so they can trade more and uh, have, you know, uh, more uh, lower trading fees. Yep. So have you guys set trading fees and, and what are you guys uh, doing to uh, to come to uh, the, tr the, the trading fee uh, that each user has to, uh, to pay in order to use the exchange? Yeah, so, we're, we're <clears throat> so our trading fees will be dependent on the, the different markets that we're in, um, simply because I think our trading fees would, you know, want to like we want to compete with, you know, the local exchanges and provide a, a more competitive pricing. But the interesting thing is that, um, in a, you know, I, I don't, my, my gut feel is that, you know, say, for example, in a bull run, you know, most people don't really care about trading fees. I mean, most people are willing to pay whatever it is to kind of get into the market. And we saw that, you know, uh, with, with Coinbase, for example, where the fees were extremely high. And people are willing to pay whatever amount it is to kind of get into the market. Um, so for us, it's you know, I guess the uh, the best way to kind of do it is you know we want to you know we want to follow the benchmark in each of those markets. We would tier the trading fees based on you know the the volume that they trade. Uh, so to to kind of provide the power users with incentives to to trade with us. Um, uh, but I guess for more kind of crypto to crypto, and this is for fiat, but then for more crypto to crypto, I think we'll have to be, you know, very competitive um, because obviously other exchanges, the bigger exchanges would, you know, would provide a, a very low trading fee. Yeah, um, the the crypto, the exchange uh, ecosystem is very competitive. I mean, there are so many exchanges um, and, you know, it seems like um, there are always new exchanges coming out, and in order to you know remain in competitive, you have to have low trading fees. But also, it seems like having the fiat on ramps is a you know one a, a, a really important component uh, for an exchange um, to to have because they can you know they can seem like if you have a fiat on ramp, you can maybe charge a little bit more higher trading or trading fee. Because yeah. it makes it easier uh, for users to be to get into the crypto ecosystem. Yep. Um, so, let's see. Um, talked about trading fees and monetization. So, how how do you guys anticipate your revenue streams coming from? Do you guys have like a, a layout of where you expect revenue coming from? Like, let's say thirty percent trading fees, thirty percent um, listing fees, thirty percent um you know other services how do you guys look at like where you guys plan on uh generating revenue and what those streams are i think i think at the moment the main focus would be on um on trading fees uh simply because that's just the core revenue generator for, for exchange business um where where i think would be really interesting obviously is you know the implementation of margin trading um and and that would kind of incite more activity um but obviously that kind of will be dependent on, on where the market is at. So, you know, greater volatility would be better. Um, but uh, at this point in time, you know, where, where there's, you know, almost well, no volatility in the market, um, you know, there, there obviously won't be a, a lot of, you know, activity or volume happening. Um, and I think, you know, as a business, you would want to kind of diversify, you know, um, your, your kind of your revenue streams um, and, you know, the other, the other revenue streams that exchanges have is, you know, withdrawal fees, um, listing fees, and so on and so forth. But I think um, that's all very, uh, I, I, think, I think those will be, uh, you know, it, it will be saturated and, and I think it will be eroded over time. Um, that, that, you know, the type of fees that we want to be earning in the future is on, on, on custody of assets and also... Uh, yeah, custody of assets, uh, and 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 the way we want to do this is you know through you know building out our, our custody solution because the custody solution itself, the reason why we we want to build that out as opposed to kind of using a third party is simply because I think you know when, when, as the industry evolve, you know um, there there will be 
uh, other services like asset management, which is currently really not in in the crypto space at all. Um, so, you know, in order to kind of provide asset management services, you need to have, you know, custody of, of clients' funds. Um, so, so for us, it's, you know, building that, you know, core capability out as well. Um, and then, you know, once you have clients, you know, assets, then you can kind of provide them with the service of managing their assets and, and whether, you know, it's um, uh, investing in, in whatever projects that are coming up or, you know, a basket of different um, uh, uh, tokens. Um, there, there are many ways that we can kind of do asset management as this evolves. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at, you know, eventually kind of moving more towards like a wealth management platform uh, for mm -hmm. our clients as opposed to just pure purely as an exchange. I think it changes for us at the moment is very important because it, you know, it's the gateway, right, for, for kind of so-called old money to move in to this, mm -hmm. um, you know, fiat to crypto. And, and we want to be that gateway, right? Then we're after, and, and, and if you kind of look at the entire value chain, right? So, you know, clients come in, deposit their funds, and then they buy crypto. Then what's next, right? So yeah. what's next is, do you provide the type of tokens that your clients want to invest in? Yes or no? No, they go somewhere else. Yes, they stay on your platform, right? Mm -hmm. So after they invest in those tokens, then where do they store it? Then do you provide those services? Yes, no, no, they'll go somewhere else. Or yes, mm -hmm. they'll stay with you. Now, if you, they stay with you, then it's like, okay, what else can you offer them as part of that value chain? So the whole idea here is to kind of capture that entire value chain over time. Then what you have is like an interactive broker where clients are super sticky with you, all right? Um, and they won't go anywhere else. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, like having the whole ecosystem and the value chain. And so, you know, other financial products like lending and, uh, you know, margin trading and, you know, interest and, you know, asset management, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's also all these uh, lending services that are coming out. You know, we had on BlockFi and a couple other um, lending platforms uh, where people can you know, deposit crypto and take out loans of crypto. And so, um, you know, it makes a lot of sense to uh, just have that whole ecosystem uh, so people deposit into the exchange and then, you know, they have their security tokens there. You have your broker platform. Uh, they get dividends on their tokens there. Um, yeah, I mean, for the long term, it seems like, you know, the players that will succeed will be the ones that offer all those features in addition to just the exchange. I mean, that takes a lot of time and development um, yeah. and investment. Uh, but as, a, you know, the ecosystem develops, that's, you know, that whole uh, all those features are going to be important. Yep. Um, so you mentioned briefly the loyalty token uh, that you guys are going to be offering. So the, the, the exchange uh, token. Yeah, the exchange token. Yep. Um, so is that going to be similar to like the Binance token or the KuCoin token or um, what is that going to – and do you guys have a launch date for that? Um, we do. We can't really kind of um, – uh, mention anything about that at the moment because it's still under wraps. Um, but we will definitely let you know um, once we're able to publicly announce it. Cool. Yeah, we'd love yeah. to have you on again to talk about it once you guys are ready to announce and launch and uh, you guys can discuss it with us. Sure. Um, all right. So I talked a little about the features. Maybe we can jump. Uh, we're getting short on time here. So maybe we can jump sure. over and talk about uh, the team that you guys have and uh, the funding uh, that you guys have raised um, and uh, maybe some, so a little bit about, about that. So uh, yep. how, when did you, and, and when you guys started working on the project? Yeah. So, so we started working on this project, um, you know, kind of early, well, kind of late 2017. Um, I mean, it was, I, I guess back then it was, um, it, it was really kind of conversation starting. Uh, and then obviously we saw kind of the bull market happen and, and that obviously accelerated the, um, you know, the process for us uh, to, to, to set that, you know, to get the, the exchange up and running. Um, um, you know, the team consists of myself, you know, um, so, you know, I previously ran a company called OneFlare, started and ran a company called OneFlare um, and then I partially sold it to Fairfax Media, which is the largest media company in Australia. 
and then I moved back to, to Singapore, which I'm originally from. Uh, we have Lawrence, who is um, previously the, the head of operations at Huobi Global, which is based out in Singapore. So he joins us as a co-founder and COO. Um, we have um, Bank, uh, that's his nickname. Uh, he is the executive director of AEC Securities. Uh, so AEC Securities is the company that we uh, did a joint venture with in Thailand. Uh, so he joins us as, as a co-founder as well. Uh, we have James Tippett, um, who was the head of engineering of Airtask uh, in Australia. Um, so he joins us as a CTO. And we've got Ken Tabuki, uh, whom I worked with um, and actually went to university with. Um, so he joins us as, as the CFO. We have a number of advisors on board. We've got Dr. Satit, who's actually our most active advisor at the, at the moment. So he was the former chairman of the Stock Exchange of Thailand. Um, and we're looking to bring him on board as a chairman uh, once we get the, uh, the license in Thailand. Uh, we have uh, Eric um, Smith, who is the SVP for, uh, who was the SVP for, for Visa Global. And we have Matt um, Quinlan, who was the, um, the CTO of uh, Visa Global as well. Uh, we also have Professor Chaya, who is the Vice Minister of uh, uh, Vice Minister Vice Minister Vice Minister Speaker to to the Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand. Um, wow. So so these are the number of uh, uh, advisors that we have on board. Um, we are also uh, and and with our partnership with Decentralized Capital, we're going to get you know Calvin and and uh, and Steve Moss on board as well. Mm, nice. Uh, so I usually ask uh, my guests uh, some general questions. Uh, so what have been some of the greatest uh, successes so far since you started working on this around uh, two around a year ago or a year and a half ago? Uh, what would you say has been the biggest uh, uh, success to date if you could choose one? Um, I think the biggest success to date has been to to assemble uh, the team. Um, I think it's very challenging to find. Well, firstly, I think it's very challenging to find um, exceptional talent, um, and then especially within this industry where it's so young. Um, so you know, having, for example, Lawrence on board, uh, who was you know previously with Wobby, so having a subject matter expert like him to come on, um, you know, lends a lot of you know uh, credibility, and obviously it. it it helps us understand the exchange business a lot better and a lot faster. Um, so I think, and then and then assembling all these different people as well as it's been the most challenging. Um, and and so I think um, it's probably you know going to be the uh, has been the most successful thing that we've done so far. Mm -hmm. Uh, so looking forward, what would be an important metric through which you would measure success over the next twelve months? Um, so I think I think it kind of breaks down to qualitative and quantitative, but purely on a quantitative basis, um, it, it's really about you know for us it's like retention of customers, right? I think getting customers on board isn't the hard part. I think if you were to, for any exchange to throw enough money at acquiring users, they will be able to achieve whatever number that they want to achieve, right? But at what cost? Um, that's a question mark. For us, it's about um, the retention of customers. So, uh, and and really, what it means is, you know, how active are these customers? Um, and the uh, you know the activeness of this of of these customers will be dependent on on what we actually provide on our platform, and that will be pretty key. External factors we can't really you know control. Um, if Bitcoin decides to go for a nosedive, um, and you know, and on all volume decides to drop, then I think that's across the board, and we can't really do anything about that. Um, but assuming that the market picks back up gradually, um, then the, the the biggest factor is, you know, or the the biggest metric is kind of the re, you know our, our customer retention ability and and the activity on our platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, all right, so all right, uh, so my guest on the show today has been uh, Marcus Lim, CEO and co-founder of Zipmex. Uh, thanks for coming on. It was great talking to you, and uh, we look forward to having you on again soon. Thanks, Angelo. It was great to speak to you today. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Bounty Zero X podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast below. 
check out BountyZeroX.io, the number one bounty hunting platform where you can complete work and earn cryptocurrency. Please consult your professional financial investment and tax advisors before making any investment in initial coin offerings. Bounty Zero X does not provide investment or financial advice and does not endorse or recommend investment in any ICOs advertised on the Bounty Zero X podcast or website.